So far we've mainly discussed the hardware side of my minimal 8-bit CPU design. The only thing missing is the microcode inside the control logic that makes everything play. Well, this is where I was a year ago. I thought I'd be just one step from being finished and I was wrong. If you want to find out why and why I've enjoyed it nonetheless, let's get started. The design of even a simple CPU architecture looks challenging at first sight. But what I've learned is that the fun begins when you think you have a concept and start writing microcode for it. I realized, oops, my hardware can't do this and that, and I thought, well, let's add another two registers. Feature creep is raising its ugly head. More registers need more control signals, more EEPROMs and wires and breadboards and so on. Since I am a lazy guy, I didn't want to go down that lane. Instead, I went through an iterative process of streamlining microcode and downsizing its hardware requirements, so one would just fit the other. During that process, my fix point was the question, what is the minimal system that performs like an early microcomputer? Think Apple I or Altair 8800 here. What the design I came up with has to offer, that is stack subroutine capability and word operations and relative address modes and bit shifting and memory mapped I.O., that is really nothing special. In fact, the design is intended to be rather boring but accessible and as easy to understand as possible. I think unique is really only the fact that the design can do all this stuff just barely. I enjoy very much the search for the break of edge and keep creeping forward. In order to have a common understanding of the basic principle of this CPU's control logic, let's briefly review three points here. First, the control signals are always set with the falling edge of the system clock. Let's call that the start of a clock cycle. And second, outputs are level controlled by the control signal and therefore, if activated, remain active during the entire clock cycle here. And third, reading and counting operations are triggered by the rising edge of the clock in the middle of a clock cycle. This ensures that outputs have enough time to stabilize before they are being read by another module. If we quickly jump into the schematics here, we see that all registers and counters directly use the system clock. The important exception is the 4-bit step counter inside the control logic. It is triggered by the inverted system clock, as you can see here, that is at the falling edge, enforcing the desired change of control signals at the start of each cycle. Next, let's remind ourselves that our CPU uses 16 control lines. We will need to play around with them a lot in the future. We have counter in and counter out, for our program counter, followed by count enable, simultaneously incrementing the program counter and the memory address register, followed by instruction register in and instruction step counter clear. Next, we have the three ALU control signals, carry in, invert B and ALU out, which also reads in the flex into the flex register. Next, we have the LSB MSB selector, followed by memory address register in. And finally we have RAM in, RAM out, A in, A out, B in and B out. These 16 control lines are driven by the output bits of our two 8-bit EEPROMs. We can associate each control line with a unique bit value. This way, at any given time, the combined state of all control lines can be represented by a 16-bit value, also known as control word. The EEPROM's output data is being selected by 13 address lines, that is 4 bits from the step counter, 6 bits from the instruction register and 3 bits from the flex register. Inside an EEPROM the data is organized sequentially, like I've shown here. Let's say these 16 green cubes represent 16 consecutive control words of our first instruction, that is its 16 microsteps. The next instruction, here shown in red, would then follow sequentially, and so on. However, I find it easier to picture this data using the Y direction to denote the instruction number. So now each line represents one instruction. 
our CPU here will use 64 different instructions. In addition to that, an instruction may work differently for each of the eight different flags combinations. Let's make use of the Z direction to visualize that. Now each vertical slice represents one opcode, but fortunately the majority of the instructions does not depend on the flags values. In this case we can simply put the same control data in each flag level again and again. This is inefficient and wastes a lot of EEPROM space. We could do better, but at the cost of design simplicity. So let's keep it simple here. In C++ or Java we would represent our EEPROM data either as a one-dimensional array or as a three-dimensional array. In either case it's just a chunk of consecutive memory. The rest is eye candy. After a reset we start in step zero, but we don't know to which opcode this step belongs. How can we execute the correct instruction then? Well we can't, until we fetched it from memory. Therefore the first step of any opcode will have to contain the same EEPROM control data, independently of what's stored in the instruction or flags register. We choose these steps in such a way that they fetch the next instruction from memory. Let's go through the necessary steps here. So we start by using counter out memory in to transfer the least significant byte of the program counter to the bus and from there into the memory address register. Step 1 does the same thing for the most significant byte by using our high selector. In step 2 here we read out the instruction opcode from RAM and move it into the instruction register. We also increment the program counter and memory address so both point to the next byte in memory. That's kind of handy. So at this stage we know which instruction we are dealing with. From step 3 onwards the microcode will have to be written individually for each instruction. Let's pick out an easy one here, the NOP or no operation instruction. We already know the first three steps and IC simply resets the instruction step counter back to zero asynchronously so that the control logic immediately executes step zero of the next instruction. We can fill up the rest of the 16 microsteps with zeros in our EEPROM array. And this is it. We have written our first instruction. I think it'll be good to visualize the data flow a bit. So in step 0 we move the LSB from our program counter onto the bus and into the memory address register down here. On step 1 we do the same thing with the most significant byte put it down here. Next we can move the content of the RAM onto the bus and into the instruction register. Let's now pick LDI for load immediate. LDI loads the byte immediately following the instruction into the A register. Luckily after our step 2 our program counter as well as the memory address register already point to the correct address. So we can simply use as a third step RAM out and A in followed by count enable. I see again marks the end of the instruction. Let's visualize that again. So RAM out moves the content of the current RAM location onto the bus and A in reads it into our A register. I have omitted the trailing zeros here. Let's have a look at some instructions that are using the ALU, that is add immediate, subtract immediate, increment and decrement. For ADI we again see the same three steps at the beginning. RAM out B in moves the argument immediately following the instruction into the B register. Next we activate the ALU's output, putting A plus B onto the bus. And with the rising edge of the clock we read this result back into A and store the ALU's flags in the flags register. SBI works almost the same, except that we invert B by using the ES control signal and add 1 by using EC, since subtracting B in 2's complement is equivalent to adding the inverse of B plus 1. Let us see the data flow for ADI again. So we move the argument uh, from RAM into the B register and our ALU outputs the result onto the bus and we read the result back into A. Maybe you have noted that there's the potential for a little conflict here. If we read in the result A plus B back into A 
doesn't that immediately change the ALU's output again to A plus B plus B? The answer is yes it does, but only after we have read A plus B, since all inputs are edge triggered. So that's ok. Let us now take a look at the instructions that either increment or decrement A. This feature is really handy to implement loops in our program. We see a single B in on step number 3. That seems odd. Something is being read, but without a valid output, right? Well, let me bring up the schematics of our CPU again. Down at the bottom here you can see the bus lines are pulled high by these 1K resistors if they are not driven actively. And since we haven't set the high signal, the inverse of high is driving the bus line number 7 also to high. Therefore, our control signal B in is effectively reading in a hard-coded value of 255 or FF hexadecimal. In the next step of our increment instruction, we first invert FF back to 00, 0 by using the control signal ES and then add 1 using the carry in EC. And we are done. For decrement, we simply add our B value FF, representing minus 1 in 2's complement, to A and we are also done. So it's kind of interesting to note here that by not outputting anything to the bus, we can generate the values FF if high is inactive and also 7F if high is active on the fly. We will have to make heavy use of that feature when we are implementing stack operations in the next video since the stack pointer is at address 7FFF. Now let's see how to store the content of the A register at a certain memory location. This is done with STA for store A at absolute address, followed by the LSB and MSB of that address. The microcode looks a bit longer here, but let's go through it step by step. On step 3 we use RAM out, B in, count enable, to move the least significant byte of our target address into B and we increment PC and the MAR to the next memory location. RAM out memory in high transfers the MSB of the target address directly to the program counter. B out memory in moves the LSB from B into the memory address register and finally A out RAM in stores the content of A into the RAM. Let's quickly visualize that again. So we have RAM out B in count enable, RAM out memory in high, B out memory in low, and after that we use A out RAM in. And as a final step, use count enable again to have the program counter point to the next instruction. As a last example, let's consider the GPA instruction for jump to absolute address. GPA interprets the two following bytes as a target and moves that address into the program counter. Let's analyze how this could be done. Again, RAM out B in count enable puts the LSB of the target address temporarily into B and increments PC and MAR. Next, RAM out counter in high takes the MSB of our target address from RAM and transfers it to the program counter. And B out counter in puts the target's LSB into the LSB of the program counter and we are done again. There is one final thing we should consider. And this is how we would organize this information in an array that we can write to an EEPROM. I am sure there are a ton of different approaches here, but I found it easiest to do that by defining the mnemonics to be equivalent to the microcode steps we've just worked out, like I've shown here. We have to fill up with zeros here, so everything lines up correctly. We then set up our EEPROM array by filling in the 64 mnemonics in each of the 8 lines where each line holds microcode for a certain flag combination. In that way we fill up all the 8192 bytes of the EEPROM. Whew, this is basically it. I am not going to cover how to actually write that data into an EEPROM. There are a couple of good solutions out there, ranging from professional EEPROM writers to do-it-yourself solutions. I'll put a link in the description to get you started. So far 
we've covered only a few instructions, but I hope you see that it is doable. We will have a look at more complex instructions in the next two videos. Let's close here with a little pop quiz again. How would you implement the instructions LDA for load from absolute address and STR for store to relative address? Let me know in the comments what you would suggest. Take care. Bye.